tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa, nā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrew Cushion, and I am your facilitator today on this Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Thank you all so much for coming to join us. I'm from Internet NZ, and alongside us to pull this event off today are the fine people from Access Alliance and Access Advisors as well. And I'll be doing some further introductions as we go through. Before we kick in, I'd like to open us with a karakia uh, in order to set us up right. Pakataka te ho kita uru. Pakataka te ho kita tonga. Kia ma kinakina ki uta. Kia ma tara tara ki tai. E hi a ke ana te atakura. He tio, he hoka, he ho hu. Tihe mōrio. Now I'd like to talk for a little bit about the context of why we're all meeting here today. And this is event is at an important time as we think about after this COVID incident, how do we set up a more accessible online environment for everyone here in New Zealand? There's a lot of things happening that are spinning up and trying to make things even better than they were before. But nevertheless, accessibility requires deliberate action. It is things risk not being done on purpose, and nevertheless, that we may not be able to make the best of this opportunity to build back better than what we had before. This session today is about starting a discussion about how we can overcome this. It won't be the end of where we get to, but today we'll explore some perspectives in order to make this right, uh, to, in order to make this better and hear some of the ideas about where we can improve things. Now, I'll take a couple of minutes to talk about some um, logistics here. There are some accessibility features that are available. There is captioning that is available in this chat. There are two ways that you can enable that. Both are accessible off the more menu at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you may either turn on the full transcript which will appear in the sidebar, or you're able to turn on the subtitles, which will appear at the bottom of the screen. Thank you for the suggestion that we can pin it. We have people working on that now as to what might be possible. There will also be sign language interpretation that will be added after the event when this is uploaded online. We did try to have live uh, New Zealand sign language interpretation available today. Unfortunately, they have been unable to join us. Uh, and again, I can repeat those captioning instructions throughout the event uh, as we do this. I'll include a link now in the chat with those ideas about how to turn on the captioning. Now, in terms of a question and answer session here, we are pretty tight in terms of how this agenda done uh, will work today. We have four fabulous speakers and we want to give them all an opportunity to talk. However, I will also be trying to uh, allow as many questions as we can during today. Now, please forgive me. I will not be able to get to all and to everything. Thank you to those of you that have already lodged a question in advance. We'll try to cover as many of those as well. If you would like to ask a question today, the best way of doing that is again with another bottom, uh, button at the bottom of your screen, the one titled Q&A. Uh, that's where we will be looking for questions today. Uh, and they will come to the panel in general. And I'll do a bit of traffic management here in order to try to keep the conversation flowing and the like. So again, please forgive me. If you ask a question, we may not be able to get to all of them today. It looks like we may have hundreds of people and that just means that I'm going to have to make some tricky choices about which questions go ahead. So please don't be offended if I don't get to yours. Now, Finally, and I'm nearly through these logistics people, and then we'll get into some of the meat of this. There is a chat available. It is again via another bottom at the bu button at the bottom of the screen. I can see heaps of content in there already. Please do chat away with each other. 
But as you do so, please remember a code of conduct that we will have for this event, which is about making sure that everybody can participate fully and in as an inclusive way as possible. And we'll be sharing a link to that code of conduct in that same chat as well. Finally, if you have a technical issue, chuck it in the Q&A too, and we'll get to it as best as we can. One more little bit of preamble, I promise, and then I am going to be quiet at least for a wee while. Uh, I'm here from Internet NZ, where I'm pleased to have the role of engagement director. We at Internet NZ believe in an internet for all, and that's why we're delighted to be here today, because being able to have an internet that every New Zealander can participate in in every way, shape or form, to be able to do what matters to them, to their communities, to their ideas and their initiatives is what we stand for. And accessibility is a, is a huge part of that vision to ensure that those tens if not hundreds of thousands of New Zealanders aren't excluded from our internet that we can use together. Now we've been talking about a five point plan for digital inclusion recently that is designed to increase the amount of people that are included in our online life here. We've had some feedback that accessibility needs to be a huge part of that. And I wanna thank those people that came back to us and told us that too. I'm here today to not only speak to you all, but to listen to and learn more about this area as well. And I want to thank you all for the opportunity for us to be here from Internet NZ. I promise that's it. Now I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker today is Steve Barmer, who's the Managing Director of Pixelin. Pixelin is a leading Wellington-based web design and consultancy firm that builds basically websites for the government and commercial market. Steve has extensive experience in the software development process in both the web design and web application spaces. And Pixelin's primary focus is on the development of user interfaces and user experiences that provide effective two-way communication. Steve's going to talk to us about some of the commercial business realities about making accessibility work. And the floor is yours, Steve. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, welcome all. The focus of my uh, discussion this, this afternoon is going to be how business is moving fast online. <clears throat> and it's not necessarily considering accessibility. The truth of the matter is historically accessibility has been something which has grown over time. Um, I think it's important to go back and look at history in that right back at the beginning, as far as the digital trading world was concerned, back in the mid 90s, it was untried and it was high risk. Um, a lot of money and a lot of effort was put in at that stage and quite a few things were learnt. But as I would say, a lot of money was also burnt. The key to it at that stage was actually to get the store to be replaced by the web. And it wasn't going to work very effectively unless we had a transition, a cyclical process between the two. So a lot of the effort was to get the potential purchaser to go into the store, get a token or get some form of initiation that would then put them onto the web, create an offer and loop the system back. So that was how we were building familiarity in those days with the web and getting people across it as an alternative channel, as an alternative medium. It was a trial and error process for many of the major retailers at that stage. And in truth, I think you'll find that the market has only really assumed that type of purely web-based training probably over the last five years. And as a result of that, we've faced a lot of change in a short period of time. It's been exacerbated and accelerated quite clearly by what's gone on with COVID-19. So from there, it is really a case of taking a look at what the current position is. Um, and there are a lot of those entrants that have come and gone at various points in time. There was a lot of investment and there was a lot of loss, but a lot of those lessons have now actually been applied and applied quite successfully. You will see a lot of high dollar web investment at the moment from your high street companies, the people that traditionally from a retail point of view, you've been going and buying off the high street. They have actually managed to replicate a lot of their functionality, a lot of their delivery processes as a standard business. I had a brilliant example back in the, uh, late 2010, probably 2008, around that, that time, where I was confronted with one customer who said, 
I need to go online. How am I going to go through that process, Steve? The, the answer was, look, we've got to do it gradually. And one of the things I asked them was, how much money do you actually commit to a high street store? And all of a sudden, I had a number that was ballooning left, right, and center in front of me. And I wondered how this was actually going to apply. The truth of the matter is we took about a third of that and invested in the web. And within a year, we were getting a store count of about a third, shall we say, of what was doing in the normal stores. After three years, that shop was the number one performer for that particular retail chain. Uh, and the investment had been well, well worthwhile. But in doing so, it was experimental. There wasn't a lot of issues in terms of let's deal with accessibility. It was very much a case of trying to work out what the path to purchase is, have the customer find and select a cart full of goods, and then check out. And that was the key in terms of what we were trying to achieve. Now, that was an emphasis from our point of view on the effectiveness of the user interface. It was single purpose. It was trying to get that path to purchase confirmed and give a positive user experience when you came out the other end. Now, that was for your atypical type of customer. It wasn't dealing with a lot of in-depth things. It wasn't dealing with variance in terms of those processes. It was replacing the pure operation of going into a store at its lightest touch in terms of what was happening. Now, that experience was a high investment, as I say. Now we're getting into a situation where you're getting a lot more people wanting to get involved in the web itself. And there's a lot of new entrants out of there, a lot of small to medium businesses that are saying, I've actually got to be in this market because if I'm not in this market, I'm not selling. And that's actually really significant in terms of what people are seeing at the moment. It's not just driven by COVID-19. It is accelerated by COVID. There's no two ways about it. These people are under competitive pressure. And that pressure is now, because of COVID, pressure to survive. They've had to change their means to market, the way they are looking at their customers, the way they are, I would use the word, attacking their market. Because quite frankly, they need to be aggressive. They've got to get out there. It is a complete change of paradigm that they're trying to deal with. The other thing that's quite important now, and it's happened over the last, probably the last five years, is the cost to get into the market has been considerably reduced. These people are now in a position where it was a major, as I explained before, a major capital acquisition to go into the web. Now it's not. Your cost of entry can be as low as $25 a month if you're happy to do it yourself in terms of what's going up. And you are seeing these sites coming up all the time. It is a massive proliferation of this type of activity. I think the key thing here is to say that these exercises are now driven by economies of scale. The software has got so inexpensive and the hosting has got so inexpensive that people can actually do this and take part in the market. One of the things that's key here is that a lot of this is internationally driven. We are not building the software, the CMSs, the, uh, the customer interface software in New Zealand. It's coming from offshore and it's being hosted offshore. As a result of that, New Zealand is a very small player in that market. These organizations, I'd rattle off the likes of uh, WordPress and Foursquare, are very major organizations in terms of what they're doing. We have little influence over what's going on. Where we look at it is to say, right, this is a DIY product. Choose a template out of a range of templates they've got. Choose your color palette. Load your content, your product, and your pricing. Hook in a payment gateway. Drop in a courier system or a courier service, and you're away. Now, that is a retailer who's desperately trying to change their modus operandi. It isn't somebody with a lot of expertise who knows a lot about accessibility, a lot about design, a lot about how to put these solutions together. It's effectively a templated, let's drop it in place and see what happens. To a large degree, it is suck it and see. They don't actually know how successful they're going to be. Once again, it's coming back to that core function. I just want to secure my market and secure what's go going on. Once again, no cognizance of accessibility to any greater degree they make the assumption that it's in the package. The package is doing it for them. The problem with that is you've got content loads and a number of other things going on. They don't appreciate the fact that they have a major impact on that accessibility. So once again, they've got confidence in the external organization. They think it's there. 
it's not so much their fault that it's not there, it's the fact that they don't recognize it's not there and don't do anything to address that situation. So I think the summary of that is the business assumes that accessibility is inherent in the package. So I think the next thing to say is where a business fits that package, it will buy that piece of software because it's the logical cost effective thing to do. In order to address that situation, to optimize the accessibility, the business itself needs to engage somebody who knows what they're doing, utilizing a UX UI specialist, utilizing an access specialist to say, how can I make this better for this set of users that at the moment I don't think I'm capturing? And that's where we need to go from a marketing point of view. I think the other thing to look at is the, is the traditional web, customized web software. And you've seen a number of those things spun up in a hurry. It's a different segment. It's the, it's the area where all of a sudden a developer says to a potential person, yes, I can do that for you, or yes, I can do that for you. And they build up a piece of software to actually meet a particular targeted function. Now that targeted function may address the needs of the business, but it doesn't necessarily address the needs of all of the users. It is a case of a specific piece of software where the, where the customer doesn't really get the advice that they need in terms of what it's, going to what it's going to do in the market, what impression is going to be given to people who are the edge cases, shall we say, from the target population. And that is a significant problem. Accessibility fits in in that area. Also, technical literacy fits in in that area. One of the problems that you have when you're developing websites like this is that you have to aim at a particular target market. It is the person who is going to be the middle user always in terms of what's there. That potentially is where you're going to get your income from. So the other thing, and I think it's really relevant to say is when people do those processes, they don't ask for a, an accessibility assessment in terms of what's happening. The procurement process doesn't say we need to do this as far as a particular percentage of our market is concerned. It's not written into the instructions. I don't often see it written into commercial instructions. Um, I definitely see it written into government requirement standards where they basically say, yes, we have to adhere to this particular set of standards. As I say, commercially, they're not aware of it. It's not that they don't want to do it or don't know that it's necessary. It's the awareness that is actually a major problem. And I think you've got to respect them in a large number of situations right now, especially under COVID. Their market is changing. They're trying to keep the lights on. They're trying to make sure that their business is going to be there in the next. At the moment, I think they'd be lucky if they were saying the next six months for some of those retailers, but that's really what their immediate target is. Okay, so from a um, major point of view, you've got big e-commerce platforms. Now, those e-commerce platforms are the things that we've dealt with for many years, and they've been around probably for five years now. We're in the second cycle of those products. Three to five years would be the time in which you would redevelop or replace something like that. And the issue with it is that those are very, very expensive things to go back and enhance as far as accessibility is concerned. The vendor of that product should have been aware of it in the first place, and it should have been built into the first version of the software. They shouldn't have had to have been reminded or asked to do it at a subsequent point. But I think it's really important to acknowledge as you go through any participation that that is commented on, that somebody says, yes, this particular piece of software hasn't got the accessibility functionality that we would actually require. The other thing is, a number of those cases, you can't go back and fix them. You have to wait for the refresh or the replenishment cycle. So it's making awareness of those, from those organizations that yes, they are in breach at the moment and the next time they make a software selection, we need it to meet these particular requirements. All right, now, I think the, the issue from um, my perspective is that originally this space was dominated by developers. It's evolved over a period of time. It's evolved with the companies that have learned how to work in this market. It's now becoming the primary public facing channel for businesses. It wasn't before. It was always your bricks and mortar. Now, if you're looking for something, let's be honest about it, the telecom the old, in the old days used to say, use your fingers, let them walk through the 
yellow pages. Now we're walking through the internet. We, need, we tend to have a philosophy which is destination based. So being able to search and being able to find things is absolutely critical. And that's not just hard for somebody with accessibility issues. The search criteria, the way search works is not well serviced by any organization at the moment. It's moving forward, it's improving. Uncle Google would probably be the best in terms of what's going on. But the moment you try and get onto somebody's site and search, you've got an issue. So really, I think you've got to highlight what's happening from a company point of view. And that is that the cost of adapting to these changes, financially stretching organizations, it has, it will continue to do so. They will go for the lowest common denominator, but they need to be reminded that they've got additional responsibilities to the rest of the public to be addressed. I think the two things that are key from my point of view is that, yes, there are a lot of highly trained people and aware people when it comes to UX and UI at the present time and accessibility issues. They need to be utilized. We need to be tapping into what's going on. Commercially, they have to be recognized. It is, they are newer to the market than they have been, but nonetheless, they're making a valuable contribution for us all. The other thing that's critical is when a piece of software is actually completed, people need to emphasize that the testing process has two major areas outside the basic functionality. One of them is security, which is your privacy, and the other one is accessibility. And at the end of all software development projects, when you're going through that testing process, those are the two th key things that need to be addressed, security and accessibility, before you get sign off, before something goes up on the web. And as a business vendor, as a software developer, I'm acutely aware of that is my responsibility to make sure that the testing is done at that stage. The other thing that I think is key, and I, I'm not sure how many people are aware of it, but in the government sector, we are mandated to actually adhere to the accessibility standards. So straight away, I know what the standards are that I'm going to meet. They're up there on digital.gov.nz. It's a good reference point for me all the time to look at what's occurring. But also there's a comment in there that has recently arrived. I think it was re-edited on the 20th of January this year, which basically says anyone who delivers a service to the public has a responsibility to make sure that the information can be accessed by everyone. And that is key and that is really where I am coming from in terms of my participation in today's session and my involvement uh, in, in Internet New Zealand. So from my, from my point of view, the online content has to be accessible. Everybody's got to be treated equally and we've got to get on with the job. All right, that's my close, Andrew. Uh, I hope you've got a couple of questions for me, but I'll leave that up to you. I do have a couple of questions for you, Steve. And look, friends, this is how I'm going to be running the questions. There are, there are three different sources of the question. One is the Q&A button down there below. The second one is the comment and questions that you may have lodged uh, on your way to sign up for this event. And the third is my own creativity listening to these speakers. And please, I need all of your forgiveness again because I'm not going to be able to do all of these great questions justice. I reckon I can fit two in here. Uh, Steve, the first one comes from somebody who pre-registered here and they say that they find a lot of websites they visit are accessible, but that the emails that they receive from those businesses are say full of um, images uh, or with not tagged text. How do you think you can educate your customers as to that entire ecosystem view as to how their infrastructure works? This is more than just a website problem, right? And I totally agree. With a number of the sites, I, one of the things that you read in my preamble, Andrew, was the fact that I'm interested in two-way communication. And this fits that bill 100%. I'm right into templating up email responses so that they meet the need of the actual person, the recipient on the other end, by standardizing those, by templating them. That's actually quite important in, term with, in terms of what's being discussed here. I'm not quite sure that I've gone as far as testing them to the same degree as I test my websites, but I take that point on board and I think I'll consider that in future. Thank you. And I've got one more, which I'll take from the Q&A box here. I thank you, Kevin Prince, for asking this. I am going to adapt it a little bit, Kevin, because I think Kevin's asking about how we could assign responsibility to the web developer. 
And, and I'd like to broaden that out, if I may, please, Kevin, into asking about incentives here, Steve. In your experience, how do, what could be or is an effective hook to get your customers thinking about this and considering these sorts of deployments? How do you get their minds here if they're not there already? I, I think there's an issue here of fairness and equity and basically saying to them that you need to address this for a certain set of reasons. Incenting them is not easy because we're dealing with people with limited funds, especially at this, this end of the market. These, we're talking about the retailer, the person who's putting the website up. Their priority is always to try and get as the maximum bang for their buck, to get there, get there as fast as they can, and then refine over time. One of the things that I like is the idea a number of my customers have of every three months, they come back with a set of enhancements and it's usually from the feedback of their market. They've got a comment session on their website. The people are saying, it would be good if you did this. This isn't happening. Can you help us? A lot of sites don't have that type of functionality. It is just a site. They don't pick up the feedback and they do not react to it. And that actually is a really good incentive for the owner to see how his market is reacting to his software. Well, this is something that doesn't quite work well on the uh, uh, on these live formats for these presentations. I'd normally ask us all to join me in thanking Steve for addressing us today, and instead you just left with me clapping on my own, the sound of one set of hands clapping. I will need to move on at this particular point. Thank you so much, Steve. Our second speaker today is Neil Jarvis. Neil Jarvis is a self-employed contractor who specializes in technology innovation, which is relevant to blind people. He works on such issues as increasing access to information, books, online and physical electronic services. Neil has worked for many years in the field of online content accessibility. He works with businesses, governments and not-for-profit organizations, along with online content developers, to ensure that websites and other electronic systems are accessible to everyone. Neil's an active user of Braille, mobile devices, AI-based technology, and traditional computer systems. And as an early adopter of new technology, <laughs> uh, he imports, te imports devices when necessary in order to keep up with the cutting edge of development. And Neil today is going to talk about the lived experience, his lived experience and that of other people that he's come into contact through his experience. Over to you, Neil. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Andrew. And can I first of all congratulate all the organisations who have put this excellent webinar together and on this auspicious day. I'd also say congratulations and thank you to the many people who are attending and it's a fabulous number of people who've registered so thank you to all of you for that so here's a snapshot of a typical day for me in my life online and it's from this monday if you really want to know i have used online content to do the following I've kept up with the news. I've done some shopping for groceries. This is all on Monday. Ran my business. Operated my bank account. Paid a few bills. Yeah. And I looked at a menu for a cafe because I was going for lunch for the first time under level two. I did some social media. And I looked at some sports information. Sadly, not a lot of results right now. And I looked up radio and television program schedules, all in one day. Now, it's probably quite a quiet day in some respects. Every one of those things that I've listed, when I first started out 30 odd years ago in the adult world, I was doing all of those things, but it was much, much harder because most of them were, well, all of them, in fact, were paper-based one way or another. Usually, I would struggle to get access to any of that information because it was in a print format that I could not read. 
So now that so much of this is online, it's a real boon for me and people like me. But you know, the, den the denial of freedom is a crime against justice. It's just wrong. But arguably, there's something even worse than that. And that is if you've got freedom, you've gained it, and then somebody takes it away again. And that's what sometimes happens in our online world when we are faced with a website or an online platform that was once accessible, that for whatever reason no longer is. And it's those sorts of things that we need to guard against whilst celebrating the wonderful things that we can do while we're online these days. Many of us in the Lyme community today will tell you that there's never been a better time to be blind, precisely for the reasons that I outlined at the beginning, all those things that I did online on Monday. But that just makes us hungry for more. And I think we can reasonably expect to have more. I don't think we're being unreasonable. I think that um, accessing a business or a service website or any other part of its online content, uh, content is only possible when the accessibility of that content is assured. I can remember many years ago when I first went online to do some grocery shopping. It was in the 1990s. And I'm going to give you an example, which I, I forgive. <laughs> Please forgive me if I've bored several of you in the audience with this before, because there'll be some of you who've heard it and will have heard similar ones from other people I know. But I went and did some online shopping. And I went to a grocery store in the UK. And it was accessible. Better than that, I did a search for cornflakes. Pretty innocuous, really. But, uh, and I thought, because my life had told me that you could get cornflakes in different sizes and you could get them in, um, by this time you can get kind of different flavors and things. I had no idea how many dozens of hits I would get when I typed cornflakes. I had no idea how many brands there were, how many options within each brand there were. It was a revelation to me. And you can apply that across the entire line of <laughs> grocery content, but not just groceries, electronic devices, um, so many other things that when you walk into a supermarket or you walk into a shop as a sighted person, you know it's all there. I had a vague idea, but I had no real idea. It was completely new to me. That's what online content gave to me, an understanding of the world as it really, really was. So it's ironic that at a time when um, we as disabled people know about isolation, we've, we've, we've understood it all our lives. We can teach the people who've experienced isolation through lockdown a thing or two about that. So it's ironic that as that isolation comes to an end and people are able to get out more, that we are seeing a rush quite understandably to more um, online availability. And I welcome that. But for all the reasons that Steve outlined, and I thought that was an excellent uh, contribution that Steve made, for all those reasons, it's simply the case that sometimes we're going to be disappointed and that's not acceptable to us anymore. So what I would say is I, I would point as Steve did to the government web standards, uh, web accessibility standards, which are mandatory for government agencies, but they're not mandatory for even for local government and they're not mandatory for the private sector. And as Steve said, they're not even really known about by those groups. But you don't have to have them mandatory to, to adopt them. Good practice says, you know what, here's a good idea. Why don't I use it? And 
if you're working in um, local government, you should really be imitating the work of your central government colleagues anyway. The fact that no one's passed a law that says you have to yet shouldn't really be a reason to wait until they do. It's best to be ahead of the curve, guys. I think that um, as we get to uh, a time when more and more businesses and more and more service providers understand the value of accessibility, what they will understand is that we as consumers are just that. We're consumers. We have money to spend. We have contributions to make. We're citizens. We have votes to cast. We have opinions to be consulted upon, just like everybody else has. So the idea that um, making your website accessible is a nice thing to do, a good thing to do, yeah, that is true, it is. But don't do it for that alone. Do it because it's a sensible thing to do. It's economically the best thing to do for your company and your business long term. It's, we get a better democracy when we hear from diverse voices. So when government and local government and others put out um, anything for consultation, they need to hear from everybody. And that means they need to make the process by which they hear from them accessible. So it's economically sensible, it's socially sensible. If I have a good experience using your website, I'm gonna tell people, doesn't matter whether they're disabled or not, I'm gonna tell them. And they're gonna say, oh, well, I wanna put my dollar in that direction as well. So, it really is the best form of advertising you can have. So, I would say that as a user, what's important to me is knowing that I don't have to be concerned that when I first visit a website, I'm going to be disappointed by it because that's, a, that's something which we've kind of got used to over the years where almost expecting disappointment we shouldn't have to expect disappointment we're entitled to expect excellence and with the availability of standards with the availability of experts who can advise on those standards there's really no reason why we need to be disappointed any longer so Andrew, I'll hand back to you. If there are any more questions, I'll be happy to take them. And um, I'm looking forward to the conversation generally. Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, and there is that particular set of phrases that you ended on has really resonated with me, at least in terms of expecting that excellence as, a spo as opposed to expecting disappointment. In your experience, just with your rule of thumb on mm. Neil, how many, how many sites here in New Zealand do you expect disappointment from at this rate? If you were to guess what proportion of the sites you use any given day are well set up for this at that level of excellence, what would be your estimate? Um, it's low. It's low to medium. Um, and that's because many sites you can get by on, but you have trouble with. So we're not here to name and shame, so I shan't be doing that, I promise you. Um, but I was using a well-known news outlet website on Monday. And um, did you like how I did that? <laughs> and, did. Um, <laughs> and it was, the article I wanted to read was, once, I was, once I'd found it, was perfectly readable. If it wasn't for the fact that there was some lovely flashing animation that kept interfering with, the reading process that I was undertaking. So as well as reading the article, I was getting some lovely adverts about um, uh, certain properties in, in a certain city uh, that just made the reading experience a nightmare for me using a screen reader. Now other parts of that website were perfectly okay. So it's, it's not that, that just that a website either is or is not accessible, it's that you don't know what's gonna happen when you go to different bits of that website. Um, and again, 
echoing what Steve said, I'm a big templates fan as well. I think if you, if you build your sites around templates, you're going to minimize the risk of things like that happening. Um, but yeah, so the answer is it would be a lot higher if some of them didn't fall down um, on some of their pages. I'd like to also add a question that came in from the registration process. And again, friends, the question and answers are open and I'll dip in and out and ask as many as I can. Uh, Neil, if you had the ability to address all of those web builders from central government, not the people like Steve, but Steve's clients, yeah. and uh, you said to them, and you could tell them anything, what would you really like those writers who are working on content for government websites to know how are they doing given that they've <laughs> already got the obligations and the standards that they're meant to commit to? Well, we know, I mean, I've been quite involved in the development of those standards over the years. And um, we know that uh, the standards are excellent and they're a fabulous benchmark to have. Um, they're aspirational as well as achievable. And we know that many departments don't achieve them yet, but, then, but now they know what to do in order to. So um, some do better than others do, and um, some do really well, and some do really appallingly. So, um, and they know who they are because they've been through audit uh, processes. So there's, again, no need to name and shame. So what I would say to them is take those standards seriously. They were developed over a period of, of time, an extended period of time, to enable you to do the job that you're there to do, which is to communicate with your consumers. So that's the best message I could give to them. But also, um, I also echo the point that was made earlier about, yep, build your site with standards in mind, build your site with um, the goals of that site in mind but test test and test again something which we're hearing a lot in current times um, but do test with people who who are liable to be able to tell you how well your site works in a variety of circumstances with a variety of technologies because you don't know who the next person is who's going to be visiting your site you might have a typical user but there is really no such thing as a typical user. I have one more question for you, Neil. It's another one that is, uh, came in advance during registration, and I think it's particularly useful, and I say this with a smile for someone who is on the technology <laughs> bleeding edge here. It requires a little bit of a crystal ball, I think, though, uh -huh. in terms of how you see the accessibility challenge, this challenge and opportunity evolving in the future both out in the community and online, are you seeing new challenges as technology evolves and or new solutions that are coming as well? Of course, yeah, it's, it's a, a moving platform. Um, so the, the reason why we need to, why the, um, why the um, web content accessibility guidelines need to be updated periodically is because the technology is updating more than periodically. It's updating all the time. And, um, you know, people are using different devices to access their content. More and more is being done through mobile platforms and tablets and phones and things like that. Um, and the standards need to be extended to fully apply to those as well. Um, but we're using different platforms. 15 years ago, none of us used social media in the way that we do today. Nowadays, it's a major part of of, of many people's lives. And um, many of those platforms are quite challenging. Um, so, and the, and the same goes for, you know, in any, in any working environment, most people will have come across um, content management systems. They're becoming more and more challenging, but they can be tamed and they can be made to be accessible if the rules are followed. I want to thank you there, Neil. That was fascinating. We're now going to hear the saddest noise in the world, which is that of one man clapping, saying thank you. <laughs> I'm sure that it is joined by our other attendees here. Uh, but thank you so much, Neil, for bringing that valuable perspective uh, from your eyes in terms thank of you. your lived experience.
I would like to introduce now our third speaker today, and that is Chrissy Cohen. She's the Chief Executive Officer of Kāpō Māori and the Chair of the Access Alliance. Chrissy is of Ngāti Kahunu and Ngāti Pūrō descent, and Kāpō Māori is Aotearoa Incorporated as the oldest national indigenous disabled persons organization in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Like the X and Like the Access Alliance is a collective of like-minded NGOs, disabled persons assemblies, businesses, community groups and individuals working with the government to put inclusivity at the heart of a more inclusive Aotearoa New Zealand. She's a passionate advocate for Indigenous and disability rights and has had the privilege of serving her community and her iwi nationally and internationally. Now, I know that Chrissy is going to talk about some important work that she has been doing on new legislative ideas in order to lift practice here and what can't be done like we've covered already through incentive, technology and standards and through looking after your customers I think Chrissy's got some new ideas as to what can be done there too. Over to you and thank you, Chrissy. Chrissy, you are still muted, I'm sorry. We've missed the start of you talking. There you are. Ah, good boy. Um, kore, kore. Rehitapanu takiri mai te ka ata, ka ao kao, ka watea, ti hei mauri ora, te nga koutou ki a koutou, kua tai mai nei ki te tautoko te kaupapa o te, te nei rā, nō reira te nga koutou, te nga koutou, te nga koutou katoa. Uh, kia ora everybody, on behalf of the founding members, grassroots campaigners, supporters and partners of the Access Alliance movement, Thank you to Internet New Zealand and Access Advisors for inviting the Alliance to be part of the post-COVID digital imperative web webinar panel and organising the event to celebrate Global Accessibility Awareness Day. There's never been a, a more important time for business and people with access needs to engage in conversation about a digit, di digitally inclusive and accessible Aotearoa New Zealand. I'm going to talk to you about the Access Alliance um, and our work with, with the government to accelerate the introduction of accessibility legislation. My corridor will include sharing the journey and evolution of the Alliance from a collective in 2016 to a movement in 2020 and our campaign for the introduction of accessibility legislation, the Accessibility for All New Zealanders Act. I'll also be sharing our observations of the responsiveness of government to people with access needs during COVID-19 and the opportunities we see for business in the COVID-19 economic rebuild and recovery. And lastly, share some information about the 2021 People's Choice Accessibility Awards for business, which we will be putting out the call invite um, in later this year. So firstly, the Access Alliance and, and who we are and what we are and why we are. Okay, so in 2016, a group of disabled persons organisations like Kāpō Māori Aotearoa, disability service providers like Blind Low Vision New Zealand and disability advocate organisations um, came together to talk about making accessibility legislation a priority on the government's agenda. As um, Neil and has shared the in New Zealand we have a lot of standards but there is actually no actual law that ensures um, that at, you know the the standards around ensuring access uh, accessibility for um, disabled, disabled peoples as an example are enforceable um, so this this galvanated the, the discussion amongst these diverse um, organisations which um, would not normally come together. Um, I'm just putting it nicely. Um, you know, some, you know, being advocates on one side, being lobbyists on others, and being um, representatives of challenging um, the status quo. 
So it was quite monumental. So we started in, in 2017 to launch a campaign called Access Matters. And we used um, digital technology, media and people power. And it was from our internal networks and regionally uh, based volunteer campaign advocates. And we, we spoke with ministers we, about access barriers that exclude full participation and affect individual well-being. We provided evidence, for example, almost a quarter or 24% of New Zealand citizens identify as having some form of disability. People aged 65 or over are much more likely to be disabled, 59%, um, than adults under 65 years, 21%, or children under 15 years, 11%. We lobbied th that the introduction of accessibility legis legislation was the right and smart thing to do. The NZIER economic modeling uh, report of 2017 projected that by becoming accessible, the government would add 1.45 billion annually to real GDP by equalizing the unemployment rate for disabled people to the national rate would make a 270 million per annum gross fiscal saving and would decrease future welfare costs by up to 3 billion over 10 years. In 2018, we presented a proposal and evidence to Minister Sepuloni, Minister for Disability Issues. And throughout the year, we continue to share with her um, evidence of why the government should consider introducing um, accessibility legislation. It, it, in December of 2018, Minister Sepuloni announced the Accelerating Accessibility Work Programme to investigate whether the introduction of accessibility legislation was the best and right solution for all communities in Aotearoa, New Zealand. So that programme looked at um, and working on investigating what would be the best option. Was accessibility legislation the best option? Um, searching overseas and looking at um, what had occurred in countries like America, Europe, um, France, um, and Canada. This landmark announcement by the minister and her vision of an accessible Aotearoa, New Zealand for all people with access needs, extended the accessibility uh, extended accessibility beyond the boundaries of the disability sector, with our collective affirming our commitment to leave no one behind. So what did that mean? When Minister Sepuloni announced the work programme, she talked about also the access needs of seniors, the access needs of people whose um, second language was um, English, the access needs of parents. Um, and so access and accessibility was not a, you know, involved a lot more um, people in Aotearoa than was first envisaged. Of course, what we were really wrapped about from the disability sector is that we, we were, had the opportunity to lead this collective of, um, of people and organizations um, to, to drive through to government the introduction of legislation. So come on, roll into 2019. What we, what we worked on during that period from February to November was working with government officials to design and um, then implement, implement the ex ex Accelerating Accessibility Work Program. And by the end of December 2019, we, our network had increased and we recorded just over 6,000 like-minded individuals 26 supporting organizations and 14 business champions. Um, and so the Access Alliance had evolved from not just a collective, but to a movement of uh, diverse and, and very different groups and individuals, um, which is fantastic. And, and we're very grateful for the support we have from these our organizations and our supporters. Roll into 2020, in February, we commenced working with the, again, government officials to draft um, for the minister the cabinet briefing paper detailing the findings of the, the um, work program um, 
um, that we had be we had, we had worked on during 2019. Then, of course, in March 2020, the world as we know it changed. Um, and so in April this year, due to COVID-19, the Access Alliance reviewed our position and revised our goal, which is now to have the Accessible Aotearoa New Zealand Bill introduced and in going through Parliament in 2021. Access may have started within the, disability, within the disability community, but there are many other groups in New Zealand who have access needs. Our movement has grown to include these groups. Age Concerned, Arthritis New Zealand, Multiple Births, Local Councils, our supporters, and we have business champions like Tsudima Hotels and Resorts, Genesis Energy and AJ Hackett Bungie New Zealand, to name a few. Our journey has been successful so far because it's been built on the evidence of people power. Um, hearing um, the story, Neil's story again, is it, that's where um, the essence of what we are about and what we're wanting to achieve comes from. The stories of those that live on a daily basis having to deal with barriers that exclude them from being full, uh, participating um, um, in contributing um, people in New Zealand. So what's the next steps for the Access Alliance? Well, we'll, we'll continue to reach out to the business community to share the case for why accessibility is an opportunity and what the benefits are for business. We will continue to work with officials to provide feedback from the Access community to inform policy advice. In pre-election period, we will campaign with all parliamentary parties to make accessibility legislation a part of Aotearoa New Zealand's post-COVID-19 rebuild and recovery. So if you're not already an Access Alliance supporter, I call on every one of you today to go in and get in behind our movement for accessibility legislation. Reach out via our website or Facebook. But now I'd like to just quickly talk around the impact of COVID-19 response and the opportunity to rebuild together Today I'm talking to digital accessibility and inclusion, but I'd like to highlight that the Access Alliance believes that accessibility means people can live independently and participate fully in all areas of life with dignity. Accessibility is not just about the width of the door, it's about information and communication, customer service and accessible education and employment system universal design of public facilities, goods and services, including digital space. The government's COVID-19 response brought to the surface the deeply ingrained culture of systemic exclusion towards disabled people, whānau, and other people in New living in Aotearoa, New Zealand with access needs. It continues to be evident across government. We know that the current web and digital standards and guide, guide, guidelines didn't do its job during the COVID-19 response, the Accessibility Charter and the government standards on accessibility were disregarded at the very time they needed to be um, in, implemented. As we rebuild Aotearoa New Zealand in the post-COVID world, the Access Alliance firmly believes that accessibility legislation will be the game changer, not only for disabled people, whānau and other people living in Aotearoa New Zealand with access name, needs, but for Aotearoa New Zealand as a whole. We live in an increasingly digital world and inaccessible websites and apps in a digital world would further leave people behind. Um, I'm, you know, the story shared already, give, um, uh, you know, affirmation of this inaccessible world at the moment. As we rebuild, we must each play our part in that recovery. Some businesses are already on the journey. However, progress in removing their barriers in the digital world has been slow. Um, our future is we can use our can-do Kiwi attitude. Now is the time to forge ahead. It's the right thing to do and the smart thing to do. Education and awareness on accessibility is a crucial component for all organisations so they understand and have the know-how to become accessible over time. We have experts like access advisors who can help business in the COVID rebuild to be accessible to all potential customers. 
20 organisations have signed up to Internet New Zealand's five-point plan for digital inclusion, COVID-19 and beyond. As we progress through the COVID-19 world and the recovery towards the new normal, we must come back together to ensure that disabled people, whānau and other people living in Aotearoa New Zealand with access needs are not left behind and left out. So what's the opportunity for business? The Alliance believes that online shops should be open for everyone, but what if you can't use a mouse or see the screen or hear the sound? The one in four New Zealanders with a disability and many others with access needs should be amongst those who benefit most from on online access to New Zealand businesses. Um, and once again, I refer to Neil's um, 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 sharing um, his story around accessing online um, uh, businesses. Accessibility is good for business. There's no time like the present to improve your digital offering and reach more customers. There is a cost to business, as we've heard um, earlier um, from our first speaker. The Click Away Pound Survey 2019 update found that 71% of customers with access needs clicked away from a website they found difficult to use. Most businesses were unaware they were losing money. You can grow your business by making your website accessible. We look forward to the day when we have legislative mandate to design accessible websites so all New Zealanders can earn, spend their money and contribute to the economy. Digital accessibility will support your customers to click with your business. My final um, item I want to just share is around the Access Alliance People's Choice Awards for Business. In February this year, we launched the inaugural um, awards and celebrated businesses and organizations who are leading the way to open doors, remove barriers, and include people with access needs in a variety of ways. These businesses were nominated by people with access needs who have the money to spend. Um, later this year, we will be calling for nominations um, for the 2021 People's Choice Accessibility uh, Business Awards which uh, will be celebrated online. Um, your business could be one of the nominated um, or winning businesses. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate in this corridor about digital accessibility. If you take one thing away from my presentation today, spread the word that accessibility is about all area, areas of life. We need you to get behind the Access Alliance campaign to get game-changing accessibility legislation and standards for Aotearoa New Zealand. As a start, reach out today and, uh, to start your dig digital accessibility journey. It's the right thing to do and it's the smart thing to do. On behalf of the Alliance, I invite you all to join our movement for accessibility legislation. We're about 30 to 40 years behind the rest of the world in this area. It's time to accelerate accessibility We'd love you to get in touch and join us. This concludes my presentation. Thank you again to Internet New Zealand and Access Advisors for inviting me to speak about the Alliance and our co-papa. I close my presentation with a whakatoki which reflects what we are gathered here today to do. Mā te rungo ka mōhio, mā te mō ka mōhio te ka marama, mā te marama ka mātou, Ma te matou ka ora. Through listening comes awareness. Through awareness comes understanding. Through understanding comes knowledge. Through knowledge comes life and well-being. Nō reira ka ti taku kōrero tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou, tēnā koutou kato. Ka huri. Kia ora, Chrissy, and thank you very much. That was Excellent. There was one bit right at the end there that caught my eye in particular that I'd love to hear more about. That 30 to 40 years mm. was it behind some other parts of the world? Uh, that's incredible. Mm. Uh, what are the sorts of countries that, that are that 30 to 40 years ahead of us? And what does that look like? Mm. Uh, I'm keen to know what the very best exemplars here are doing and what we can learn from them. Yeah, um, I suppose like one of the, the every country has has implemented 
um, legislation. And one of the first ones that comes to mind, of course, is America. The USA was one of the first countries to do so. Um, and their legislation, you know, as an example, enables um, consumers to actually sue business and that. So that's one example. Then, of course, we, we have, and, and this is where we took a lot of um, interest in, was Canada and how Canada, how Canada uh, Ontario in particular, has, um, has had developed and, um, and, and introduced legislation. From their list, uh, their list um, you know, their learnings, we, we observe um, like timelining and things like that and, and looking, um, you know, the development of standards. And one of the things that um, they're, they're currently um, looking, talked about, um, and I'd like to acknowledge a gentleman called David Leposky, who was a key driver around that piece of legislation, was ensuring we have regular reviews of this legislation. Other countries, of course, in one and um, Israel, and um, has they also introduced um, accessibility legislation. And when we, of course, we started to talk about it with Minister, we had to acknowledge that even Australia has has already introduced accessibility legislation. Um, so you know. And we're still sitting here, you know, and, and the experiences from um, our, our organization's view in the disability um, arena has seen that, like Neil said, there's great standards being developed in, um, for business in particular, also standards around um, buildings and things, but sadly, they're not enforceable. Yeah, so that's why there's other, um, why we we are lobbying for accessibility legislation, and that's why these other countries did. So again, you know, um, that's what we've been working with government on is looking at these these other countries, which have yeah are well in front of us, to be honest, like America. It's fascinating. Thank you for talking about that. I'd like to throw a question from the Q and A here as well. Thank you, Glennis. Uh, and would you, Chrissy, please be able to talk about how the Access Alliance. Uh, works for people with cognitive disabilities. Uh, Glennis, thanks you for the work that you do in mm. the Access Alliance, but could you focus a bit on the cognitive disability sector there as well, please? Um, cognitive, yeah. When we, we have involved, you know, included in the Alliance, uh, you know, a variety of members. And, and, and so we have organisations or disabled people's lead organisations that have members that have cognitive learning or, you know, cognitive um, impairments as well. So when we, we look, when we, we haven't got into in depth around standards or development, but from a disability perspective, um, we 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 you know we definitely um, uh, discuss and 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 have um, very much in front of us that sector of our community. Wonderful, thank you. And one more for you, please, Chrissy. Uh, this is one that came in in advance, and I am going to modify it just a little bit. Um, another example of how we can do things better post COVID potentially. What opportunities do you see arising through flexible work and work from home opportunities that may benefit uh, that may benefit the people you represent? Mm. I suppose, yeah, when you like flexible work, um, this is a this this question in particular is a close one for me because um, and of course for having having been home based and having staff who, ha who live with um, disabilities. Flexible work in, in home opportunities, again, would be looking at um, ensuring when standards are developed around um, um, employment um, rights and um, employment contracts and, and these conditions, employment conditions, that there are standards that recognize and, um, and ensure the rights of disabled people or anyone with access needs having the choice. Yeah. Um, again, I can't get into too much depth because we're still to get involved into the more um, meaty side of things. But definitely, the opportunities would be there. As as um, 
within um, introducing standards um, um, that would be um, enforceable by the legislative, um, by accessibility legislation to ensure the rights of any person with access needs, including disabled people, um, to choose whether they want to work at home or not. Um, as an employer of disabled people already, we already do that anyway. Um, but it would be great if we could see other employers um, providing that without having to be, um, you know, frowned at and, and pushed into that sort of situation. Mm. Thank you so much for your contribution today, Chrissy. Uh, I have learned a lot and I'm sure that the other people on this call as well have too. Now, dear guests, I will take care of applauding Chrissy for you since I am the only one that can. Um, but what you can do is you can find a link inside the chat to take you to her website for uh, the Access Alliance where you can find details about how to join their campaign. So I've got the applause, peeps. You can go look on the links and see what you can do to join this important work. Thank you so much. We have one more speaker today. Uh, and that is Dr. Chandra Harrison, who is the Managing Director of Access Advisors. Access Advisors is a New Zealand-based pan-disability, digital accessibility social enterprise. Chandra is passionate about helping New Zealand businesses improve their digital accessibility and has worked in accessibility for the last 20 years in New, in New Zealand, the US and the UK. She'll discuss how the numerous benefits that being accessible brings uh, to a business and how to improve digital uh, accessibility and explain the resources and services that are available to do that. Thank you so much for joining us today, Chandra. And it's been so great to pull this uh, event off with you as well. So thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, yes, we have pulled it all off in a very short period of time, so I really appreciate all of the hard work from Internet New Zealand and from the panel, so thank you very much. Um, also, just uh, to all of the people who have come online, we've got 120-odd people who are actually tuned in, so that's a kind of a really good indication of how important uh, getting this discussion started is, so, you know, kudos to everybody. Um, so um, the, the, the problem with going last uh, when you have three amazing speakers is, is that often they've already covered off a lot of what you were going to say. So what I'm going to do is that I'm just going to go through my points as well and kind of reinforce what Steve and Neil and Chrissy have said um, and add in my little bit of a take on things as well. So from my perspective, one of the things that Chrissy mentioned is, is that, oh, and Neil as, as well, was is that accessibility isn't really just about people with disabilities. Of course, they are the most important group uh, because without accessibility, that particular uh, pop percentage of the population won't be able to access um, um, information. We're talking about 1.2 million people. If we talk about 24% of the population, it's 1.2 million people. Now, as a business person, just let that sink in and think, that's potential lost revenue of 1.2 million people. And right now, that's actually really important. And that's something to be thinking about. We're talking about people who have sensory disabilities, so um, hearing or vision. We're talking about people with cognitive disabilities. Now, I noticed that somebody was asking about the cognitive disabilities. This is one area which isn't as well um, well known and as well covered just yet, but it is something that is becoming far more important and far more, um, people are becoming more aware of it in the accessibility world. We also have people with physical disabilities. But if we change the story a little bit, instead of talking about disability, we talk about access needs, then it stops being 1.2 million people and it becomes a whole lot more. So let me tell you a story. Let's think, if we can, um, about a young mum. She's got a newborn baby. Um, this isn't anything like your cornflake story, Neil. Not nearly as good, but let's go with it. We have a newborn um, mum is nursing a newborn. It's in the middle of the night. Um, she's in a darkened room at a computer trying to do the um, groceries online because it's one of those quiet times where she can do that. But the toddler in the cot is screaming and yelling, um, and she is exhausted. Anybody who has ever been a parent will understand that feeling of exhaustion. But if we think about that, that young mum has 
a cognitive disability and the fact that she is exhausted. Therefore, she's probably not paying as much of attention as she could be. She's physically got some access needs because she's actually only able to operate one-handed because she's nursing the baby with the other hand. She's also got sensory impairments. The noise of the child screaming, the toddler screaming, the low light in the room, all of these things add into her access needs. Now this woman has no permanent disability. So she's not really included in that 1.2 million people. She's all of us. She's everyone. She's um, at some point in time, we've all had those issues, something like it. So as well as thinking about the permanent disabilities, we also need to think about the situational issues, access needs as well. So maybe you are riding the bus, um, obviously pre-COVID days when it was packed, um, you may be riding one-handed, which means you've only got one hand to operate your mobile phone. That's the situational access need. Maybe, I like one of my colleagues has done, um, you've severely cut your hand and you cannot access your mobile phone using your hand anymore. So you've got situational um, needs, uh, temporary needs. We've also got a lot of people who have undiagnosed disabilities. So if we think about things like dyslexia, colour blindness, which are issues that actually do affect how you interact with the internet, with uh, websites and apps, there are a lot of people out there who have undiagnosed disabilities. Undiagnosed access needs rather than disabilities. There's a lot of people who don't get diagnosed um, with Asperger's and quite a lot later in life. So we've got to think about that as well. They're not included in that 1.2 million people. We've also got to think, as Chrissy mentioned, about English as a second language or people from different cultures. New Zealand has three registered uh, languages. One is um, Te Reo Māori, one is New Zealand Sign Language. My apologies to those people who um, are NZSL users for today. The need, um, that is the second language, and then we have English. But what we aren't aware of is, is that in New Zealand we have loads of other people who English as a second language means that accessing information online becomes a little bit more difficult because we don't necessarily understand the content or the nuance or anything like that. We also have all of those people, the whole team of five million, who have been in lockdown over the last couple of months, who have been unable to access services. So for all of us, that's no longer the 24% of the New Zealand population. It's no longer about 1.2 million people. It's about all of us having some kind of access need at some point. Now, I'm not saying every single one of us at every particular point in time have an access need, but I'm saying that the majority of us have had an access need at some point, most especially within the last two months. Lockdowns really showed us how not having access can have a real impact on all of us. None of us have been able to easily get to those bricks and mortar stores or to the services that we've really wanted. We have had our access limited. Now, people at high risk really wanted to do their grocery shopping online. Now, I'm not talking about people with um, regular uh, with uh, permanent disabilities. I'm talking about m my um, brother who has low immune, uh, immunocompromised. Now, for him, he could no longer go to the supermarket, so he needed to shop online. The issues with those apps and website designs have become far more apparent over the last two months, not just for the disability community, because they've always known that there's been an issue, but for everybody else as well. And suddenly, it's really interesting how things that have been asked for from the disability community for years have suddenly been able to happen. So for example, I was talking to um, a young woman um, from Victoria University the other day, and she was saying to me, the disability community has been asking for lecture notes and lectures themselves to be online for years, and always been told it's too hard. But hey presto, the world, the team of five million, now needs access to that information, so we make it happen. The other thing is, is, is that we're talking about um, the continuation of accessibility needs. With all of the digital transactions that are happening now, we've got so many more happening. The contact tracing, the apps, the going to a cafe and having to download a QR code and then fill in a form. If those 
those points of contact are not accessible. Not only are we stopping um, people with access needs from accessing um, you know, the, 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 the services, but we're stopping them from actually having any equity of quality of life right there at the cafe door, where if you can't fill in that form, then sorry, there may be an alternative of signing in um, physically, but there may not be. So we've got to be able to think about that. Now, I'm not saying that digital accessibility is easy peasy. It's not. Um, as Andrew mentioned, I've been doing this for 20 odd years. And I think anybody who is a digital accessibility um, advocate knows that it's not something that you learn overnight. And there are some real barriers to making digital services accessible. One is, is that businesses don't typically ignore accessibility on purpose, but they do deprioritize that because they think it's expensive and maybe not as important as maybe they should. There's many that don't understand the full business benefits of making the website fully accessible. As um, Steve and Chrissy and Neil suggested, there's a lack of knowledge and awareness of what digital accessibility actually is. We don't have enough trained people to do the digital um, accessibility testing and designing and developing. It's a skill that takes time. We aren't including training about accessibility in the, those um, postgraduate or graduate uh, courses either. Design, computer science. I'm sorry, Andrew, am I boring you? <laughs> um, also, as Chrissy mentioned, we don't have any enforcement yet. So those biggest, there, there are some barriers. But the biggest one is the lack of understanding of the benefits. So Neil's alluded to this, Chrissy's alluded to this, Steve's alluded to this. But from my perspective, most business benefits are not just about doing the right thing. It is about that increased revenue. We're not talking about 1.2 million people who have a disability. We're talking about the team of 5 million who have access needs. It's not about just that. It's about improved reputation. Um, I don't know about this one, Neil, you might be able to tell us later on, but I'm assuming if you've got one company that has um, a better accessibility rating than another, you're probably, the, the, the disability community is probably going to look more favourably on the one that has thought about it and implemented it. It's also about a better customer experience. The business benefit, like we talk about this and it's a buzzword across business about customer experience and customer this and user focused. Well, if we think about accessibility from the beginning, we are giving um, all customers a better customer experience. Chrissy mentioned that in some companies you can get sued. And you can. Think about Domino's Pizza in the United States of America. They were sued. Their reputation was torn to tatters. They were charged a large amount of money. Um, and so the greater compliance and the reduced risk is also a business benefit of ensuring that you've got accessibility. The other thing is, is, is that I think Neil mentioned this, is about innovation, right? So a lot of people say to me, and the argument against accessibility is, but we don't want a boring website. But the answer is, is that actually, if we design for people with access needs, we can actually innovate and provide more and better and more interesting products rather than just going with the boring, it actually could drive the innovation. So I kind of think that there's one more, and this is one that Chrissy alluded to, was the improved chance for people with access needs to be employed. If we are designing um, information sites and service sites and um, retail sites that are more accessible, then we will be able to employ more people online, uh, more people, because they'll be able to access all of those things. Now I saw, I know I'm kind of rushing here a little bit, but I saw in the comments that there was a question around how do we actually address those arguments against the stakeholders that say, but it's not important. Well, I've kind of given you the 5 million. We're a team of 5 million who all have access needs at one point. So when somebody says, but we don't have any disabled customers, you can be saying to them, no, we might not. But statistically speaking, we would have at least a quarter of our um, customers would have some form of disability, and we shouldn't just be designing for them. So there's a whole lot of arguments against this. People sort of say, but we don't want it to be boring. We don't want it to be this. We don't want it to be that. The answer here is we have 5 million people in New Zealand. 
more interact more um, online interactions that are going to be occurring we need to make it more accessible for businesses and organizations to make more money and get their message across there is no real argument against that now i did mention that i was going to say give some resources around doing accessibility we don't have time to explain how to do accessibility in any detail at all because i can see andrew giving me a shove saying time's almost up but what we can do is point you in the in the direction of some really good resources. Now, Sam um, from Internet New Zealand has, uh, and Kiara um, have put in some uh, resources in the chat. Uh, so there's web accessibility content guidelines that basically uh, form the basis for the New Zealand government web standards. That information's there. There are some tips from Access Advisors um, that you can access. There are loads and loads of other resources out there. But if I was to say some of the things that I would really, really like businesses, government, education, and so on to think about, is, is that there's six things that I would really love people to be thinking about. Not on that technical level, but at a higher level. One, include people with permanent access needs in your requirements gathering and testing. It's really important that we hear it from the horse's mouth. It's really important that we see the problems that people are having um, first up. Also saw somebody say about procurement um, and when will procurement be influenced by accessibility. It'll only be uh, it will only be influenced by accessibility when the purchasers of those services push back and say, I'm not going to sign off on this product until you prove to me that it is compliant with the accessibility guidelines. So from Steve's point earlier on. I also think that a lot of organizations just don't even think about accessibility, as Chrissy said, as Steve said, as Neil said. And what we need to do is, is that we need to get them thinking about it earlier uh, so that it's part of their process. They need to put it into their roadmap rather than thinking about it too late. It needs to be part of their um, procurement, part of their, sorry, part of their um, business revenue generating um, strategy so that they can make sure that they're actually getting the money that they need. We also need to think about upskilling staff. So if you are doing your internal design, upskill those staff. If you're an agency like Steve's, you need to upskill your staff. If you are anybody out there who has anything to do with digital services, try and get people to start thinking about accessibility and what they should be knowing. The other thing, and I would be remiss as a businesswoman to not mention this, it's also about employing accessibility experts when you get stuck. It's about making sure that you reach out to the experts, whether that's people like Neil, who have lived experience, or whether that's people like me, who has a digital consultancy that is designed to help business. Now, I can see Andrew going, come on, Chandra, it's time to finish. So what I would say is thank you again for coming along. It's fantastic to see so many people um, signing up, and I'm so glad. What I would like to say is, is that there is a couple of ways that we can keep um, businesses a little bit more accountable. Legislation is one way, education is another way, but what Access Alliance, and, um, uh, along with me, have done is, is that they've created a self-advocacy kit. So if, as a disabled person, or anybody who has an access need, finds a problem with the website, there is an access, uh, a self-advocacy kit that you can uh, get from the Access Alliance website, which will help you contact the company and let them know what's happened um, and let them know how they can fix it. The other thing is we don't have any data at the moment about the extent of the problem. So you mentioned earlier on, Andrew, well, we don't know how bad this is. We know from Neil that it's not that great, but as a scientist, I like to know my data. Now, the web, web aim in the United States does surveys, um, and they can tell you that it's pretty bad. The UK has done um, surveys in the past, and they say that it's pretty bad. But what about if New Zealand starts doing a survey? And that's one of those things where maybe, um, I don't know whether it's Internet New Zealand or the government who starts thinking about reviewing a sample of websites to see, to quantify how bad this problem is. We've, um, Access Alliance has also created a survey so that if people do have any problems, they'd love it if you could report that so that we can kind of get a view of what's going on. 
So Andrew, my final point is thanks again. And this is the start of a discussion. Um, that's the whole point of Global Accessibility Awareness Day. What we'd really like to do, I know Sam has a poll there, is, is that we want to kind of hear from those people who've attended about whether or not they'd be interested in a series of more webinars around specific access needs and how to help businesses make their um, content more accessible to various different people. So thank you from me, and Andrew, I'm handing it back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Harrison. You've actually covered off a lot of the questions that we have here already. Thank you so much. So I'm going to mangle something and make something up instead, which is always a challenging moment. Uh, is there a particular cardinal sin that you see that comes up often in the work that you do? A particular, one particular thing or a couple of particular things that you see just that come up in so many different ways that harm the accessibility of sites and initiatives um, that you just wish wasn't the case? I think there's quite a few of them, um, uh. Andrew, unfortunately. So what I would say is I did actually, here's one I prepared earlier, um, is, is that I actually have a list of about 10 things that do come up um, on a regular basis that you can access through the link that Sam's provided in the chat. Um, and, but but if, I, if I was to say you the biggest thing, um, the biggest thing that is easy to fix um, is the alternative text issue, right? Making sure that any images that you have have alternative text. It's an easy fix. We should all be doing it, social media, websites, anywhere. If there was a bigger one that I find even more problematic um, is the keyboard accessibility. So for people who don't use a mouse, um, they may use assistive technology of various different um, degrees. Making sure that you can navigate a website or an app just using the tab. So tabbing forward and shift tab to move back, enter or space and arrows to move around the page. If that was done, then it would support a lot of other assistive technology. So screen readers, um, any of the switch users, uh, a lot of that technology really relies on keyboard accessibility. So if there's one that I hammer home to most of my clients, some of whom are online, so hey, um, is to make sure we get keyboard accessibility right. Thank you so much. The, and a round of applause to you too, from me, on behalf of everyone. Yes. Those, that's our four speakers for today. We have still got around about 10 minutes left though slightly tighter than we had dreamed of, which is an opportunity just to throw it out a bit more and just to have a bit of a discussion. If you have got a particular topic that you think is important for that discussion, where you hopefully we can hear as many of these four perspectives as possible, then please do throw it in the Q&A so that we can uh, get it on the table. You will have already seen a poll pop up, I believe where we were asking you all whether or not you would like to do this again, so to speak. I am certainly keen. I think we've heard four fantastic perspectives today. Uh, but, uh, and thank you to all of those that did tick a preference there as well. It looks like there's some demand there. And where we've got a demand in an audience would be silly if we didn't get it back together too. I'm buying time here to get you to put your questions in people so I can put in a discussion. So I'll say one more thing that I didn't make clear at the start. Uh, we will be uploading this session uh, onto the website uh, and we will be uploading it onto YouTube too, I believe. So if you want to come back and see these sage thoughts again and or if you think that somebody's missed it who would have loved it, then please, um, you'll have a link to share as soon as possible. I'm going into that Q&A. Let's see what I've got to work with. Fantastic. Thank you, people. This is brilliant. Hey, does anybody have some thoughts about the challenge here that we're, we're talking about a global platform in the internet and that we see many, some, I, I certainly won't quantify this, that we see some international providers that are doing things well due to the size of their platforms and perhaps some gaps from the New Zealand-based providers. How are the New Zealand, how's the New Zealand developer community responding to this opportunity and challenge? 
versus the international lot. Would anybody like to respond to that? And I'll pick someone if I need to. That's okay. Uh, let, let me take that one, um, if I can, unless Steve wants to, because he's probably more connected to the developer community. But um, I'm, I'm really happy to take that one because I think this goes back to Chrissy's comment about the fact that New Zealand is actually way behind the rest of the world. Um, other organisations, other countries have had the legislation and the, um, the active pushing of accessibility for so much longer that they... Um, that, that, that a lot of organisations insist on having their websites accessible or their services accessible. Um, I've worked with clients uh, locally here in New Zealand who are saying that they um, have an onshore um, audience and an offshore audience. Now, they weren't bothered about the onshore audience, but because they worked in the States and they had um, United States, uh, American um, clients, they suddenly had to... Ex um, they suddenly had to remediate what they were doing so that it met the um, American guidelines. So I would say that the only way that we're going to push New Zealand businesses to keep up is to get that legislation in place, to improve the education, um, and that is, is really all that we can do. The reason that businesses in New Zealand are not doing the same as overseas is because nobody's making them do it. Nobody's asking them for it, nobody's forcing them to do it, and they don't really know that they should be doing it. Um, Steve, would you have any say, to say on what the, about from the developers and the designers' perspective? Yeah, I think the most important thing is to recognize the fact that they do what they are asked to do in a development environment. So they only go as far as is necessary, either by whoever's giving them a directive or the client wants to invest. And if the client's expectation isn't that it's there, they won't do it. The only other thing I would point out is the growth of the IT space in New Zealand in terms of exporting software. You're absolutely right. We have to be cognitive of the standards offshore. And the key thing here is to actually bring those standards back on board to New Zealand and say, well, if we've got to do it in the States, we have to do it for the software universally. It'll apply in New Zealand. So I think it's very much a case of awareness more than anything else. Um, the accessibility standards for government, for those of us who develop in that space, have always been the driver. But there's that gap in that commercial space, which is not servicing the government market, that doesn't have as a higher priority. Let's put it that way. Over to you, Neil. Um, I, just uh, one comment, really, which is um, with, with my own business hat on, what I often do in presentations is show examples of uh, good examples and bad examples of uh, accessible websites, inaccessible websites. And it's not always um, uh, as simple as saying that, um, you know, New Zealand is uh, not doing it, whereas international ones are. Uh, one of the best websites I often use is our own Radio New Zealand, which is has a long track record of being um, not perfect, far from it, but certainly one of the best um, in in the in the field, and one of the worst websites I demonstrate quite happily, and I can name them because they're not here today, um, is British Airways. And when I when I compare uh, websites from airlines around the world, there are some very good examples and some poor ones. And BA, which is ba based in a country which um, should know better is one of the worst examples I've ever seen. In, uh, and and um, so I love to contrast that with, with others. But, you know, New Zealand can do it too. And Radio New Zealand proves that. And um, so I think, you know, we just need to remind people that there are good examples of good practice at home as well. Thank you so much, Neil. Uh, you have another thing. Sorry, yes, I did. Sorry, Andrew. Um, but one of the things that I was just thinking about is, is that there is a story that I've heard on numerous occasions, is, is that um, getting accessible websites does often, um, no, pretty much always, relies on there being buy-in from the organisation. Yes. 
So I kind of think that, you know, one of those things is, is that I know that we've got um, a couple of organisations online around, you know, trying to encourage organisations to sign up and actually stand up and be counted. And I think that's really important is that they stand up and they say, we want to be accessible. Let's, you know, take us on that journey and, and get us there. Um, and I also think that, um, you know, kudos to all of my clients and um, those people online who are trying. It's not an overnight win. It's something that takes time unless it started right from the beginning. If we incorporate accessibility into the processes and the strategies right from the beginning, then it's easier, much easier than trying to retrofit accessibility in there. Mm -hmm. There's one story about um, a particular airline in New Zealand. Um, a, a particular government-owned airline, in the <laughs> uh, who they actually had, uh, right up until relatively recently, they had a quite an accessible website. Like the interface was actually not bad at all. In fact, you know, you, um, I have it on good authority um, that it was you were able to go online using a screen reader and be able to achieve the task of booking a flight relatively simply. What I would say is, is that the story that I've heard is, is that not only was the organization buying into that process, but they actually did have a couple of developers on staff who were passionate about accessibility. And so it was that leading from the top and saying we have bought into this and we want it to happen, but also having the skills and that passion internally to actually push it and drive it and make sure that it is happening. Um, because no matter how much an organization um, signs up um, to say they want to do it, they have to have the skills internally yes. or employ external staff to get it done. What a fabulous point for us to end on today. And I'm going to wrap us up. We've got a commitment to you all that we'll do this at 2.15, uh, end this at 2.15. And so all you need to do is hear from me for a little bit longer, I promise. Um, I want to just summarise really briefly. I have learned a great deal today um, myself uh, from Steve talking about exactly the opportunities, challenges and realities of building this stuff in a commercial sense and how he works with customers in order to do what we can here in New Zealand and the challenges in doing more. Neil, I loved hearing your story for the first time, my friend, about the <laughs> wide variety of cornflakes. Thank you so much. But I'm really struck by your point about expecting excellence from more places and not the expecting disappointment. And the more that we could shift that pendulum along to that excellence end sounds like a wonderful opportunity for us all. Chrissy, you're, thank you for summarising the important work that you're doing in terms of advocating for new legislative measures in order to lift the bar. I also really appreciated your point about how the post-COVID opportunity is to build back better than what we had before uh, and not just seek to do what we used to do, so to speak but to have this as an opportunity to come back stronger and better, which was a lovely theme that you dipped into too, Dr. Harrison, in terms of talking about how when we think about this at its widest and fullest extent, that there is already 1.2 million people in the mix, but in a way this is everyone. It depends on temporary and situational contexts as well. And that this could just be good business if we embraced this opportunity and challenge before us to build for better accessibility. I think this has been fabulous and I've really enjoyed being part of today. Uh, and I thank all of you that have been watching us here today as well. Please accept my apologies. I'm going to do better next time in terms of clapping my hands on an open microphone while I may be tr trying to compensate for all of your silence. That doesn't mean I should consequ <laughs> that I should compensate so enthusiastically. So Susan, thank you for pulling me up on that. Now, a little bit more of the logistic stuff and then you're all released back to where you came from. There will be a post webinar survey that will come to all of you via the address that you registered on. Please do fill it out. It'll give us important feedback about how we can come back together and do this again uh, better than even this time. Uh, please do look out for further webinars run by both the team at Access Advisors and the Access Alliance. Uh, this is but one of a suite of different things you could be watching. 
We do appreciate you joining us on these busy Zoom filled days. So thank you all very much for coming along. And most importantly, we've been here today to recognize that today is Global Accessibility Awareness Day. And I th hope that you feel more informed and more aware and more empowered about what you could be do, what you could be doing, and the challenges that are in front of all of us as we look for a more accessible New Zealand. So thank you all for coming and joining us today. Thank you, Andrew. You're most welcome, friends. Uh, Hi, everyone, uh, and happy Thursday afternoon. <laughs>